Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Really, 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 really cold and fun. Cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think that of it because that's what deer and hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. Yesterday morning I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving and I'm like, ooh, there's deer moving. All of a sudden I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks what? about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's when you're the 275 pounds, I don't know how you do that. But the Freightliner. <laughs> it's just like a creeper. He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah. You know. He's like. <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping and pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. Why did you say his name? Her Hervé Velichez. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast brought to you by Pertnir Outdoors. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode, and thank you for tuning in, and thank you for your continued support of Pertnir Outdoors and the Log Talk podcast. So we will uh, roll right into kind of some of the upcoming events, continue hitting on what is going on with some of the local conservation organizations. Uh, so I know uh, to us locally here in the Rochester area and western New York and over over through central New York area, but primarily western New York, we've got... Uh, We've got banquets coming up, so whatever you're into, whether it's deer hunting, turkey hunting, maybe both, uh, maybe you're just looking for some way to get into the outdoors, uh, some of your local organizations such as QDMA and National Wild Turkey Federation have a lot of their banquets going on this time of year. So if you're interested in any of that and getting involved, uh, go to their website. So I'll, I'll just plug QDMA and I'll plug uh, NWTF, uh, both of them if you go to Google and search QDMA or search NWTF, you'll find their websites and then you can just kind of navigate through and uh, find the local events for your area. But definitely recommend to check that out. Uh, there are some outdoor shows coming up. Uh, we've got at the end of February, there is the, let's see here, there's a big fishing expo, a fishing and outdoor expo down in Suffern in Rockland, Rockland County. So that's down just outside the city. Um, so it sounds like that's a pretty cool show. So uh, that'll be starting February 27th and run through that whole weekend. So make sure to check that out. And then the following weekend um, out in our territory in Western New York, uh, the Western New York Sport and Travel Expo will be going on at the Erie County Fairgrounds. Uh, and that again will be starting on Thursday, running through Sunday. And uh, I've been to that several times and I plan on being at that this year and work in the booth a little bit for BHA. And, uh, that is always a good time and it's pretty cool to get up there and interact with some of the outfitters guides um, manufacturers things of that nature so definitely encourage you to get out and do that and then lastly we have uh, we will be working to get the information out but we're working to put it together a pint night for the week following the western new york hunting expo for backcountry hunters and anglers and uh, and that will be thursday i believe that is the 14th and uh, so keep your eyes peeled on social media. We'll be getting some posts out about that. And I'll make sure to continue talking about it just to keep everybody in the loop there. But uh, so that's what's cooking. Oh, sorry. It's Thursday the 12th would be the date of that pint night. But we'll get all the information out. Just keep your eyes peeled. Just putting it on your radar. So rolling into this week's episode, this is uh, this is one I've been wanting to put together. And uh, if anyone knows myself and my dad, we kind of are running around all over the place all the time. And uh, we've been together quite a bit over the last few months, but we haven't had an opportunity to get our undivided attention given to each other to uh, sit down and have a conversation about our family, the extension of our hunting tradition, which is the meat processing portion of it. So before we were known and uh, this whole like Pertnir Outdoors is a new thing for us, uh, you know, new endeavor, new name, I guess you could say. But uh, before dad started this whole thing out, with his brothers and called themselves the Bean Hill Meat Cutters. So you may have heard us reference that or seen us post saying the Bean Hill Meat Cutters are doing this or that. And all that is is just a group of guys 
it's our family. Um, my dad, the house that, that myself and my brother grew up in was on Bean Hill Road, and we cut meat in the garage, hence Bean Hill Meat Cutters. And uh, we we had a lot of fun with that growing up, and uh, we still continue to call ourselves that, even though my parents are living at a different address now. But uh, it's kind of our it's our identity and who we are. So I wanted to get a chance to sit down with Dad and kind of just have a, a rundown conversation of how our family got started with the butchering process of the meat, and uh, and how it's evolved over the years of 25 plus years um, with him and his brothers, and bringing us boys up through and uh, kind of growing the group to a couple people um, outside the family but have stuck with us for a long, long time. So to us, it's a great part of our tradition, and it's very important. Uh, the meat processing piece is is the not the last step. The last step is enjoying enjoying the meat. That is, of course, the last step. But getting there, um, there's a lot of rewarding parts to getting that finished product on the table or on the grill. So definitely uh, wanted to bring this to everybody. Hope you take a little bit from this conversation, uh, maybe some pointers or maybe, you know, maybe it clarifies what we're doing or how we're doing it. And, you know, at the end of the day, like dad said, we are not professionals. We don't do this for a living. We do it one day a year. Um, and every year we try to get a little bit better and a little get a little bit better. And it's something that I definitely would recommend everybody to try. It definitely brings you, I think, a lot closer to the process of of hunting and it makes it just it like deepens your relationship with the food you're eating and uh dad and i got into that towards the end of the conversation um and i think uh it's kind of cool and i think a lot of things change when you when you have a child and you are responsible for another individual i think your mindset on a lot of things changes and uh and dad and i kind of started digging into that a little bit so hope you enjoy this conversation i again we appreciate your support and uh, make sure to check us out on all the social media platforms. And uh, if you are enjoying the podcast, make sure to give us a, a like and a review or a, a rating, comment, whatever platform you're listening on, whatever you need to do to uh, give us a thumbs up there if you're liking it. And if not, um, let us know too, because I'd love to keep getting better with this and keep bringing content that you're interested in. So thank you very much again, and uh, get out there and keep feeding them. See ya listening to us with earphones yeah i have i have the headphones in so i can hear what we're talking about so you're hearing me through the device i can hear you through the device through Wait, the headphones it's high tech i gotta get some of those it is high tech you don't know this this is very high tech do you it, have another you, set because i could put them in and then i could we could just like listen to each other through the device and not even hit the record button i i don't have an, an extra no, i might actually have no i'm just kidding i don't need more wires hanging off my head while i'm trying to drive this is not distracted driving or anything. Bad enough I got a wire woven through my baseball cap. So what do you want to talk about? I do have extra headphones. What do you want to talk about? What's the right word to describe, like, Uncle, uh, like, would it be the vernacular, Uncle Chris's vernacular, like his speech? He, he, he has a much different way of talking than you guys. Because I think you, um, I think you misunderstood... Um, like he was talking, you and the podcast that you just did with him and Brian Davis regarding the recap of their Colorado hunt. Uh, you know, he was talking about that they hunt out, and uh, you're like, you hunt out. Is that a new term, hunt out? But I think that he misunderstood you, and he didn't realize that you don't understand his way of speaking. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's like the comedy right, in it. Right. Right now. Like when when I get home, Paul will say, "What do you what'd you do with Billy?" I would say we hung out. No, you would say it's you, H, you, you it's, hung hung out. No, well, I would say we hung out in the truck. Chris would say we hung out. It's H U N O U T. We hung 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 out. Like just like when he's hung over, it's he's not hung over. He's hung over. So right. it's H O N O V E R. Hung over. That means he had too much to drink so and he's not feeling a hundred percent. All along, I thought that hung over was being. Hunt, was hunting when you're hung over. No, it has nothing to do with hunting. It has nothing to do with Other than the fact that sometimes he gets hung over before he goes <laughs> hunting. <laughs> okay, yeah. so that, so I think, so he, he has some issue with those, and it, Chris, if you're listening, it's nothing against you, it's just the way you've always talked. So he maybe needs to see a speech therapist? No, I like, lady. I don't have a problem with it, I understand him. 
I, I just want to make sure you do when you're when I do now. I yeah. guess I've been confused all along, and maybe he doesn't understand why I think it's funny when he says this stuff. Yeah, but I'm just clarifying that for you. Okay, I appreciate that. So that's good. I just thought you'd want to better understand that. So yeah. it's kind of his like vernacular. Yeah, like it's like our corrections <clears throat> segment. You're correct, yeah. correcting me. Well, there's another thing I want to correct you on. Okay, what's that? First of all. You know, regarding me drifting through the woods in your opening statement. Oh, I, two, I was two wondering if this was going to cause trouble. <laughs> so, number one, I'm not 275 pounds, right? I'm like 272, so let's not make it worse than it is. All right. All right. So, then the other thing is you got the right idea. You just didn't quote me quite right because it's like like an autumn fog. You know how, like, in the, in the spring or in the fall, like, you get that fog, and one minute you're in the woods and you see through the woods, all of a sudden you realize that you're being, like, covered up by something. Like the fog like drifts in, doesn't make any sound, all of a sudden, boom, it's there. That's me moving through the woods. Okay. So But just so you know that I mean autumn breeze is one thing, but autumn breeze has nice fragrance and it's rustling the leaves. That's not me. It's the fog makes no so noise. You're fog. Drifts in, right. Okay. Alright. So I, I overtake the woods like a foggy morning. I come and go without noise or any knowledge of presence other than an occasional visibility thing. Okay. Because I am a large fella. You are. You're big. Whether it's yeah. 272 or 275, it's oh. there's a lot of mass there. Yeah. Yeah. Mass. So what do you want to talk about? Uh, if For anybody that doesn't know, I'm speaking with my father, Bill Harvey, Big Willie. Hello, everybody. It's been a while since I've been on. It has been a while. We've been trying to, you know, we don't want to unleash you too much. We know how excited you are about doing these podcasts i don't like to call in either i like the in-person thing i like to be able to i like to be able to sit here and exchange you know see facial expressions and talk with our hands and things right yeah we like to gesticulate a lot that's kind of what we do yeah yeah Yeah, it is nice and we've been talking about trying to get together and do a podcast for quite a while so i i think what i wanted to chat about today was our meat processing side of our organization the bean, the bean hill, hill meat, cutters. meat cutters yeah so we've been <clears throat> we've already done our big our big grind of the year where we produce all of our hamburger and and sausage link and stuff like that but this weekend we are going to be doing it for the first time with my crew out where i live and they've never done anything like this before so i thought it'd be kind of fun to i and i don't really even know the story about how you guys, you and your brothers and the guys in our hunting crew back home, how you guys got started even doing your own butchering? Because I don't think you were doing it originally, were you? Um, we always did our... I think we always did our own butchering, right, starting back in the... Uh, about the time we started hunting in the 70s. There was a couple of deer that we took down to Paul's Meat Market. There was a German fella down there in, in the town of Lima where I grew up in Paul's Meat Market and that's where everybody took their deer to get cut up and um, I took a couple of deer there I'm thinking like the, my very first one was um, was one that my uh, you know my dad I was 16 and my dad that's what he did took his deer there so that deer went there and then uh, my brother Mike and I as we were hunting we we're like you know why pay somebody we can just cut these up right so we would, uh, we would just set up in our garage on Briggs Road on the little farm that I grew up at there, and, and we did probably absolutely, well, I shouldn't say we didn't do any of it right, but, uh, you know, our, our idea of success was to have bags of venison pieces we could put in a fry pan and fry up, right? So yeah. we weren't really making nice cuts of meat, um, but we, were, we started butchering, Mike and I. It was just him and I. We'd like, I'd kill a deer, he'd help me, he'd kill a deer. You know, we were both living at home, so we were doing it there. Um, I think when we went to, um, there may, when we, I got married and I bought a mobile home and Mike bought a mobile home when he got married in the same park as me. And um, so we did a little cutting there, but then I bought the house on Bean Hill Road and um, had a big garage on it, which was a selling factor for me. The house was, was, uh, was rough, needed to be all redone, but the garage was awesome. That, was, extra that tall. was a huge garage. Yeah, it was like 40 feet long on the one section, 30 feet on the other, like 24 feet or 26 wide maybe. So it was a nice big garage. So we started cutting there. And then, uh, you know, our other brothers uh, were, were 
seeing success and getting going in hunting, especially like Tim. And, and then, uh, so a couple of us started cutting there, but our cutting there was like an old uh, kitchen table that we got at a garage sale and we set it on saw horses. And uh, we had an old door that we got from Penfield schools in the dumpster. I pulled it out of the dumpster and <laughs> old wood door, you know, we had that, that was a table that we used. So, um, and then we just, uh, you know, we would just throw a rope up over the ceiling joist and pull the deer up. And so, but I mean, that's where we started. And then a uh, guy I went to school with, Ricky Milne, he started with us. And then um, over time, like Joel Taylor started, but it was all really just the Harvey boys, my dad, your grandpa, and, uh, you know, the gang. So it was the Harvey boys. And then, you know, as we got going, we started, you know, and getting more and more deer. And there was a period of time there where you could, you know, God, you could get, we started getting the numbers up where you could get three, four, five deer a year with multiple doe tags and DMAP permits, and you could shoot two bucks there for a period of time, one with your bow, one with your gun. Well, we can do that again now. But it, there was a point in time where you could, and my brothers always bust my chops about this, but there was a point in time when you could, uh, with a doe tag, you could take an antler deer, and I did that on occasion. Um, so th- we got started, and then we, you know, we jokingly started calling ourselves uh local 9638 Bean Hill meat cutters, you know, the union. And then we, so we, uh, you know, we had, we made hats and uh, vests and um, we had a union meeting, you know, each year we'd go up to Naples to the cabin and we'd have a union meeting and I'd give a state of the union address and where we were at and how the funding worked. And I kept statistical data and I had pie charts of who was killing what and how many deer. So we, we had a lot of fun with that. Um, but the group never grew a lot. Every once in a while, somebody else would might come into the group, or we'd, you know, we'd cut a deer for somebody as a favor. But for the most part, it stayed a very tight group, and uh, we just didn't want to end up spending most of our deer season processing deer. Um, we process what we took, and you know that's our responsibility, right? You take the game, you process it, you utilize it. We save the hides. Um, Rick Milne's father-in-law, Lynn Rouse, longtime friend of ours. I knew him when I was a little kid. And he, we were, he was at the same fire department as my grandpa, and, and, and I served with him in the fire department, so did Rick. That's where we met Joel. We were all in the fire department together. So Joel Taylor joined us um, early on, and you know he'd been with us probably, I don't know, 25, 30 years. But Lynn Rouse would take the legs, and uh, he would make uh, gun racks out of them. And uh, they probably were not properly um, you know, cured and, and tanned and whatnot. Yeah. His idea was to skin him out, and he would uh, put him up above his heating duct in his basement for six or eight months, and then uh, they were dry. They were dry, yeah. and and he would uh, they were actually beautiful. He had beautiful wood, and he would you know decorate the edges rough of wood and planks, and put pictures of the deer. And so he he was making uh, gun racks for all of us out of the deer hooves, and we were selling the hides. And I can remember I one of my distinct memories as a kid living at on bean hill road and we had we always you know you always cleaned up pretty good shooting deer and during the middle of the summer lynn would always just randomly you know jimmy and i'd be home yeah. during the summer and you and mom would be working and all of a sudden lynn would just show up at the house not knowing that jimmy and i were home and he'd sneak in the garage into the freezer and he'd be taking burger out because he either ran out or Rick didn't have any, so yeah. he'd come over to the house just to take venison from the freezer. He loved venison, and he knew that my freezer was full of it, so he would, on occasion, uh, drift in just like I do going through the woods. It'd be just like a fog. All of a sudden, I'd open up, and I was out of Italian sausage or something. So he, uh, But, yeah, Lynn, Lynn would come in, and, I, and uh, he liked to hang out there. I'd come home and find him on the couch in the family room there visiting with Paula, and she'd be making cookies, so he's eating. He loved stopping by. He's a great... <laughs> great guy we miss Lynn you know I will nice little memory of Lynn when he passed away he uh he wanted to make his own urn I think you would call it and uh where you put the ashes and he shot a buck that was a huge buck and that was a just always his pride and joy Big George so he uh he had a picture of Big George on this box and he made the box himself in the basement so that when he died he could be buried in that box with a picture of Big George and uh, we went to the cemetery when he passed away, a bunch of us from the Bean Hill Meat Cutters, and uh, we asked the family, we didn't want to be disrespectful, but we wanted a picture of all of us kneeling next to the urn, you know, with, uh, with Lynn. So we got, you know, but he was, he was just a unique character, a great guy. 
Uh, we really miss him. He was the first member of the Bean Hill Meat Cutters to pass away. Yeah. My father was the second. No, my father was the first. He outlived dad. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, my dad was the first, and then uh, and Lynn was the second. So yeah, we've been around a long time, been at it a long time. Now, you know, you talked about grinding that we're you're getting ready to do with your crew out here. The um, what what we used to do is butcher the deer, and we always bagged all the burger meat, and then we would uh, we would take it down to Paul's Meat Market, same place that used to cut our deer. And we would tell him how we wanted the sausage, and he, he made the most incredible sausage or burger, whatever you wanted. But anyways, he would make that up and then call us when it was done. And, of course, back then everything was wrapped in, uh, you know, wax paper and freezer paper. Um, that's the way we did all our wrapping. Now we do all either vacuum pack or I don't know what you call the burger bags that we use. Burger bags, plastic yep. tubes. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, our packaging. We've come a long way since then. but. We got to a point where, like, you know, we got so many deer, and we're spending so much, you know, running this back and forth to Paul. And I was talking to Paul uh, about, you know, maybe teaching us how to do it because I knew Paul wasn't going to be around together. He's quite an elderly fella. So, you know, he uh, used to give us the spices, tell us what to do. And, um, you know, we borrowed a grinder a couple times from a guy Mike knew. And then uh, we decided we were going to buy, like, a a big heavy-duty commercial grinder not big commercial but a it's it's a workhorse of a grinder and we've had it now 25 or 30 years and uh so we bought this grinder and we all went in together i think uh, everybody i don't know it was probably four or five hundred bucks everybody chipped in a little bit of money and uh so we bought this grinder and we started grinding ourselves and ever since then we started and at first we did burger and we made breakfast sausage italian sausage that was it and then over the last probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years, you know, we started uh, making link sausage. And, of course, we're all getting on in life, and we're a little more financially secure, and we've been buying gear, and we got really nice vacuum packers. We bought a secondary grinder, um, which when we bought the same size, so all the dies and, and uh, blades are interchangeable. Um, we bought stuffers. I just bought a bigger stuffer. We thought we'd try the stuffer, and you've been running that last couple of years. It's only five pounds, and it's just you spend more time breaking it down and refilling it. So I bought a bigger stuffer. Um, so it's yeah, we've we've started out just experimenting, and now we're you know putting out. Oh, I don't know what we did this. I I think it was like we usually do around 600 pounds of product in a day, and we've gotten so we do it. And um, you know, really, we started this year. I think at seven. Breakfast was at seven, and everybody was really going by guys trickle in between seven and eight and we were done I want to say like one two o'clock and then there's a lot of time with cleanup I do the setup the night before and uh, so I mean we're we're doing a little over I figured this year we do you know around 110 to 120 pounds of finished product an hour and and you know some of it's slower than other if you're doing link and everything but uh and we've done different things, the bags that we, we buy, uh, buy some product from, the, from Lem, and we bought the, uh, the tape machine and the bags, and that saved us a ton yeah. of money because we used to use upwards of five or 600 um, vacuum bags. So it was a lot of money buying vacuum bag material and then a lot of time making all those bags. Right, you got to make the bags, and yeah. it takes time to handle the meat to put it. Uh, yes. Bulk meat from the bin coming off the grinder into the vacuum seal bags, whereas going to this setup with the bag, the tubes right off the grinder, yeah, feeding right off the the, the mouth of the grinder right on into the bag. Yeah, it's just been a game. We have two guys on the grinder, one feeding into the grinder, one actually pushing the meat through the grinder. We have a guy loading the bags coming out of the tube, and then we have uh, another guy that he hands the bags off to. And he, uh, he actually, we label the bags before we fill them because they're hard. Once you fill them and the meat's cold, then it's hard. You're writing on a wet plastic bag. So uh, one guy is labeling the bags, and then we, um, we hand them off and fill them, and then he just twists them and tapes them, yeah. and they go in a box. So it's really, it's, it's uh, oh, my God. Do you remember we used to use, uh, you were always on that crew that would, uh, we had like meatloaf pans yeah. and we'd measure up what was like a pound and a quarter or a pound and a half and you guys had to like, by hand, you're putting all that in there and then slapping it down on the table. We're spraying, we made spraying, bricks, right? Yeah, they were making basically. basically two pound bricks of burger yep. and putting them in vacuum seal bags, but it was messy. Oh, it time consuming. Yeah. 
So let's let's go back. So you kind of just ran through like. The I'm whole, sorry, I covered no, the whole thing. You, you got put. excited, but we kind of ran through like the whole overwhelming side of how we put together what the grind day looks like and how we get there. But have did, I guess you always were in the routine of when you're butchering the deer, you anything that's going to be burger was always was always just chunked up into just small manageable chunks and put in the we just put them in plastic garbage bags yeah is what we do and yeah we, we have a we, burger barrel and that, the guys that are shouldering working on uh after we take steaks and roasts out of the hindquarters um and so you know to, to get a, a visual on that we have like basically what five stations in our in our cutting in our in our uh venison cutting so we have we have a skinning station with an electric overhead winch and a scale, so we can weigh every single deer. Uh, we skin them. I do all the skinning, breaking them down, cleaning them up. There's a lot, obviously a lot more to that during gun. Um, you know, and guys at a lot of places would probably pull off a shoulder that's hemorrhaged bad and just put it in a, a scrap barrel. And you know, we're pulling that uh, shoulder off. And if we can, we salvage what we can. We're actually like, getting the blood out of it where we can trim it. Um, so we. So we got the me taking them apart, and there's usually somebody helping me. Um, but then we also have uh, we have a, a table that does steaks and roast, and that's Mike and Tim. And so their their work area is just steaks and roast. And then we have another work area um, to their left. Each of these are eight foot like countertops that we work off that are hinged to the wall, suspended by chains. Anybody that's maybe I don't know if we had that any on yeah, Pertnere, but we put some pictures up. Yeah. So we have um, two guys doing, and that's usually um, it's usually Chris and Jimmy right now, and Adam sometimes. But they they uh, burger out front shoulders, and finish off the hind quarters after we take the steaks and roast. Then we have another station that does just necks and rib cage, um, and then we have um, on that we have a, a big workbench, if you will, that we set up on on casters. And we hung an eight-foot countertop on one end of it, off the back side of it. So when we fold the benches down, we can roll the workbench in front of it, and that is actually my workbench. And uh, but then when we roll that out away from the wall, we flip up the other benches, and that has a bench secured to the back of it. So all total, we have, uh, you know, we've got 32, 32 feet of of, uh, of shelf space or, or workspace. Yeah. So those are the five stations, skinning breakdown, uh, steaks and roast, burgers on, on shoulders, front and rear quarters, and then uh, necks, ribs. And then the other one is a packing station Joel runs at now. That was Lynn's job, and uh, Joel has taken that over. So we, the guys accumulate their burger, and then uh, when, you know when we wrap up the deer, we go around with the burger barrel, and we put all the burger in. We put it on the scale, weigh it. We got tags, uh, so Joel will weigh it and um, seal off the bag and he has a tag written what deer it is the date how many pounds and everything and then he'll tag it and we put it in the freezer yeah. so and that's all documented so that you right, know that, how much everybody has in burger right and the reason we do that is because prior to burger day i spend you know probably over the course of a week i put together everybody's order so i'm i'm either texting or calling guys going okay you had uh, three deer and uh, all total burger, maybe you got uh, 70 pounds. You know, what are you thinking? How would you like it? So some guys just go, I'll straight burger. Other guys will say, I want, you know, I want to do 20 pounds of burger. I want to do 20 pounds of um, hot Italian. I want to do some links. So what I do is I actually have an order sheet I write out for every guy. And there's, what, 12 of us or so? Yeah. So I write out an order sheet, and then I find out who wants pork with it, who doesn't want pork. I like to cut mine with pork. And then this year we experimented a little bit with um, upping our pork ratio. So I always went five pounds. We did six pound lots, five pounds of venison and one pound of, of pork butt. And then I would season for that six pounds. So if I buy a uh, bag of seasoning that's 25 pounds, it'll, it'll season 25 pounds. I break that down into um, four lots. So I'm actually seasoning 24 pounds with it. And... Um, so yeah, that's a big part of it. I have to know what the weights are because I got to know ratio-wise how much pork to, you know, I'm getting 150, 160 pounds of pork. Um, so I got to know how much of that to buy, how many seasonings. So as I get the order, I have columns and I line everything up and figure out 
you know, how many total pounds are we going to make of each flavor and how many pound, total pounds of, of uh, pork are we going to need. And then I call in the order and you help me this year going and getting the seasoning. So that's all the gathering the supplies and then everybody takes their meat out. We don't want it completely thawed. You know, the, the meat that's partially frozen or still a little firm grinds much better. Yeah, you want, when you're, whenever you're processing any kind of meat, but it's in particular venison, and if you're doing multiple grinds through the machine with pork, you don't, now when we say pork, we're talking pork butt. So it's, Yeah, we it's, use ground pork butt. Guys use different things, pork fat. Some guys use, use yeah. I whatever, mean, you can use, it, you can't do it wrong. You can, if you well, some of our bacon, guys. bacon, yeah, we've had exactly. guys that are using bacon. We've had guys cut it with go to the store and buy 80-20 hamburger from the store. Yep. So, I mean, you can't do it wrong. But the, you reason, know what, the uh, reason why we're mixing it is because venison tends to be so incredibly lean that if you that it's very hard to get that meat to stick together and for it to cook slowly. So if you don't have any fat in there, it, it, it can dry out real quick yep. when, you're, when you're cooking it. It doesn't hold together as well. It doesn't hold together either. very well. Yeah. So that's where we've seen great success in it doesn't matter what we're mixing with it but just mixing in a little bit of something whether and i think this year we did several of us went anywhere from 30 percent to 40 percent on the pork butt especially especially with the with the link sausage because the link sausage it just Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, the way it turned out this year was so awesome. some guys don't want to go too much because they don't want it like they want to we're eating venison, right? They want it to be like venison. But I think that the fun thing is playing with a little bit. And you guys upped your ratio, a couple of you, with your sausage. And, um, I mean, it was it was a notable difference. With not the, that with I, the link sausage. With the link sausage. Yeah. It was a notable difference. And not that it's ever been bad. It's delicious the way we've been making it on a, on a five to one, you know. But, uh, yeah, we were doing, you know, three to five. And it was it was it was good. It was and it's fun, like you said, you can use whatever you want. Rick Milne for a period of time, we would take every, um, you know, every good big dough that we uh, got, we would um, we would save fat for him. He would save bags of fat, and he actually used the venison fat, and we mixed it into his burger, and that worked fine, and it was good. Um, the only thing we didn't try uh, that you know, thinking to the bears that we've killed, especially the the bears that we've killed in november yeah. uh, we had that one that had to have literally four inches of yeah, fat around it It was like skinning a bear twice and it would have been neat we should have uh, instead of having joey no nos take bites of it and eat it raw we should have uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we should have uh saved some and put it in with our venison as a sample right yep so i kind of ran all around there. yeah i took you in the wrong direction no you didn't take me in the wrong direction i'm just trying to think so we uh Everything you were just saying, Dad, it can, it can, it, you've been doing this for 40 years? Yeah, probably 35. 35 years. So you, you guys started in a garage with an old door and a rope, yeah. and a rope to throw yeah, over. And an the, old kitchen table we had. An old kitchen yeah. table. So don't listen to this if you're new to hunting or new to hunting, new to wanting to process your meat. You don't need to have this huge setup that dad's put together with the gang over the last 30 years because you guys have learned each and every year on you know a tool that might make it easier or if we do this this way it'll shorten the time frame it takes to get through this whether it, whether it's actually breaking it down or on processing day you know how you're measuring out the seasoning that all didn't start right. day one so there's really it's very hard to mess this stuff up where you can really mess it up is when you're cooking it yeah exactly so we've all kind of gotten a little bit better with that too and especially with everything that's out there all the information you know whether it be cookbooks or podcasts or youtube videos there's so much to learn on the yeah. cooking aspect of it but i i know i've had several people asking me as we've started posting pictures and stuff about our processing of the venison that's not normal there's not a lot of people out there that are doing what we're doing as yeah, far probably as the not volume, the volume. Yeah, discussion. I was going to say not to the extent. And yeah. and again, I'll state that we are not doing other people's deer. It, it's like we have a we hunt out of probably three camps, right? We have the Naples camp, um, and and of course you're you're hunting out here, but and you'll bring some meat back and grind with us. But 
you know, we have our Naples camp, we have our Lima crew on our old farm, that's Tim and Chris and his and their boys, but they sometimes join us. And then we have Rick and his son, and it used to be Lynn, and some of those guys, they hunt over in Bristol at, at uh, Camp Hockadell. So, uh, but w while we're all hunting our own areas, when, whatever we get, we all come together. And I think uh, we come together to process. So there's, again, we've been hanging around 12 guys, and Joel hunts some in Menden. Um, so we all come together, do the processing, and it adds an entirely, a, a, not a new maybe, but an additional layer to our season because uh, we get to see each other. Like we've been cutting every Tuesday night. So it's like every Tuesday night and we get to spend together, all the guys come together and they'll bring, you know, various guys bring a bottle of, they'll bring bottles of whiskey. I order pizza or we'll cook something. But usually I, this past year I got pizza because a lot of us come right out of work and go straight into cutting. But it's a social time for us and we're all telling hunting stories from the last weekend. Okay. And so it's, um, it's almost a way like not to extend our season, but to expand our season rather than just hunting and being within our group. There's some deer right there along the creek bed. There's, I, um, I can't even imagine, you know, shooting a deer and then just putting it in my vehicle and taking it to a processor and dropping it off. Yeah, and then going I, home I and telling... I can't wrap my head around that. Yeah, it just wouldn't be, wouldn't be the same, right? And, it, and uh, so that, there's a lot of fun in that. And on Burger Day, everybody's busting chops, you know, and like Joel's always been the shop steward... And, you know, I've been the head of the union, and if it's too cold in there, they're threatening me with grievances. We all, grievances. We all go to Joel with file our grievances, yeah. and then, you know, it, everybody can hear it. We're all in the same room. Right. So, like, <laughs> like, Joel, I'm filing a grievance. This place is cold as hell. And he's like, he's like I'll talk to him. We'll, yeah. get, we'll get this addressed. The other thing I, I want to mention, too, is that there was a member, the first member to actually die of our group. I don't know whether Gary, my brother-in-law Gary, whether he passed before or after Dad, but Gary. It was before. Gary passed away, um, and he kind of dropped out of the hunting. But it, there was a time when Mike and Gary and I, um, you know, hunting and fishing together all the time, especially Mike and Gary even more so. But um, Gary actually, he was like a, he took us like up on like two or three notches with respect to, he actually knew something about butchering. So he's like, yeah, I'll help you. I'll come over. Let me come cut with you. He was pretty good with the steaks and stuff like that. Yeah, right? so he kind of turned us on to that. And then, and so we really started producing. And not, not that our meat was bad. I mean, the meat was always well cared for, you know, and, and it was delicious. But we didn't necessarily have, like, cuts that we knew right. exactly what we were doing. Yeah. So Gary, when Jackie and Gary got together and they got married and Gary joined our group, um, he took us to the next level because he had a little bit of knowledge of, of butchering. And... Uh, so, you know, we've had some guys come and go. Really, I guess the only way out of the union is passing away because <laughs> most like everybody that's ever come with us has stayed with us the duration. And, um, but it, it's a nice, tight-knit group. And it, the grind day is a lot of fun. I think there's a sense of pride when we look back on it. We look at the volume of meat we do. And the key to us, whether it's cutting deer, you know, butchering, or whether it's making uh, – product on our grinding day is that like every it's everybody has their spot and we try to pick a day when everybody can be there because like I it would take me four times or five times as long to burger out a front shoulder than it takes Jimmy he right. flies through them well so let's that that's where I wanted to go next too is what's cool with as us kids all grew up with the group is we stepped into, you know, you guys joked and called them apprentice roles. Yeah. You were apprentice burgerman. Right. You know, but when we then you'd work up to a master burger. Right. Yeah. But we, we've never gotten off that burger table because nobody above us is. Yeah, there's no openings. Roles, right? right. But we just keep putting our time in. But that's, everybody has their job. And that's what's so fun for me coming back. And I, and it's the same way with the Kirsches. Everybody's got their job. We, we crush through it. I don't do rear quarters. I'm not good with that. I know what how to handle a front shoulder, and that's what I do. But then coming back home and we do our grind day, I've been working the packaging table and now doing yeah. the sausage stuffing, the links stuffing for the last couple of years. And Joel's been at the same spot. Joe's been at, Joe's a senior in high school, but he's been doing this with us since he was, yeah, since he was 10, 10, 10, 11 years old. Yeah. yeah. So like everybody knows their jobs and we could not, we could not do it as efficiently as we do if everybody was 
wandering around trying to do something different every time we're there or once a year. Exactly. We, we have our role. You, everybody has their role, and they, you know, once I'm, I don't I don't ever really remember anybody going, "Hey, I'm I'm sick of doing this. Can I do something else?" You know, Tim and Chris go over to the table. They break it down, you know, and they feed it to Jimmy. Jimmy does chorus grind. And uh, then it comes back to them. They add the pork. They're the, they're the mixing table. They got the big mixing bowls. And I feed them the orders. So I'm like, I'll tell them this is so-and-so's meat. This is what we're going to make. And then I feed them the supplies as far as seasoning and stuff. So I'm, I have a table set up, and I have all my seasonings laid out. And I have my notebook with all of the orders that I've taken from everybody. So I kind of... Uh, you know, we'll say, who are we going to do next? We'll say, okay, we're going to do Billy next. So then I flip to Billy's page, and I write the order, and, and we start through it. Um, and then the interesting thing that we always used to, like, take masking tape and write, like, Billy Italian sausage, and we try and stick it to a, a meat tub or a meat lug that was that's wet and cold, and it wouldn't stick. Um, so we got this idea. I, I went and bought like a hundred stir sticks, uh, paint stir sticks, the wooden ones. And uh, so when that meat, like when we start an order, we give, I'll write a stir stick that goes with that order and it stays with it all the way through. So as Jimmy is grinding it into the uh, the meat lug to go over to the to the uh, mixing table, that stir stick goes in there. And then, uh, you know, as they process it, the stir stick stays with it all the way to the point where it goes over to you and you're making link or right to the point where the guys are filling the bags off the grinder so and then when you're done at the end you just throw this stir stick away and it's so much easier just little things like that that we've learned you know have been we got a good system it's been very helpful yeah, we have a very good system it's fun and i'm excited to do that this weekend with the guys just for them to experience it and and just see a little bit different because all along this gang out here they've they just grind the meat they always did grind the meat right off the deer on butchering night. They'd go over and they had a group of people that would just be running the grinder and just right straight from chunked up burger to right straight through a fine grind once through the grinder and into... Oh, they only grind once? Yeah, and into the bag, which I don't think is a bad thing because yeah. you're not mushing that meat, Yeah. but it's it's extremely lean. And there's, and, and there's if you wanted to add seasoning... You know, we have all gotten into the routine of we don't make a whole lot of, you know, we straight, call, we call straight it straight burger. or yeah. regular burger. We don't do straight burger a lot. We have, you know, I, I've started doing more of that. And then I have seasonings, and we've been, and Jimmy kind of turned me on to this, but you'll take, um, you know, you'll season it at the time you pull it out to prep it. I just made some the other night, and, and uh, you know, I know about how much seasoning I need in there, and I put straight burger in a, in a little mixing bowl and I, I seasoned it and then made burgers, you know, and, yeah. and uh, so we've been doing that, but mostly we're making some sort of product. I mean, I don't know, we, we burned through like $120 worth of seasoning. Yeah. So if you're, if you're in the Rochester area, uh, there's a really cool seasoning shop in, right in Rochester off of 490. I think it's called Stewart Spices. Yep. And it's a awesome place. If you're, if you live in that area, I don't care whether you're you know, if you're listening to this, you're probably a hunter and you're probably be making your own sausage. This is interesting to you, but they have, they make all of their own spices in house. They bag it all there and they have a ton of, a ton of variation, everything from, I mean, anything you can imagine spice wise, like baking spices and sausage. They have a whole section of the store that's just for sausage making. And uh, when I, I stopped in there the, the Friday before our grind day and dad had given me the order and uh, I'm picking out all these bags, and this girl's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, we're doing a sausage day tomorrow? And she's like, how much How much are you grinding? And I'm like, well, all total, it'll be over 600 pounds. She's like, oh, my God, I wish our bo my boss was here. <laughs> she's like, the owner would just get a kick out of meeting you. I'm like, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's what we do. Yeah. But we had always bought their seasonings from where it, you get the so there's you some order. other markets you can go to that carry steward seasonings yeah so we were getting it and, and mike actually you know my brother mike works down uh in the city a lot you know uh, in construction but he he told me about that and uh you know so i've always thought about going there but you were on the road and and uh I'm, so I'm, i've always kind of got it where i get my pork just for convenience so i only made one trip but uh yeah it was great 
great so, sh- a great shop to check out. So if you're if if you're someone who's interested in getting pork, um, there's not probably not every meat market does this, but there's I would say just contact your local meat market and see if they have if they have the ability to prepare pork butt for you. Yep. So Skip's Meat Market is the one that you use in Rochester. Yep. They used to they used to have a, they had a place in Henrietta, Greece, Fairport, and I don't know they may have had a couple other ones, but I for years and years and years I I would. I used Paul's Meat Market in Lima, and then when he was gone, then I went to Skip's in Henrietta, and then they closed that shop down, but they still have their other stores. So I started going to the store in, in Fairport, and it's an awesome, awesome store. Yeah. So Skip's Meat Market there in Fairport, and I think they still got one in Greece, and I'm not sure there might be one in Webster. So if you want, you know, when, like, we're getting ready to do this, so I had you order the pork for me. Yeah. So you just call up them and say hey i'm looking for 30 pounds of coarse ground pork butt yeah and then they have you just tell them when you need it and And, uh so they uh it's interesting too because like when i call them like before grind day it's always like after christmas and and usually like right after new year's or saturday after new year's i'll call them and they're like oh i remember you from last year they'll get a kick out of me coming in you know right um because i buy such a massive quantity of pork um they're just not used to having people uh do it at that level but the, um, I did want to say, Billy, that you know, over the years, you look at all the equipment we've accumulated, and um, I would say I, we got to a point in time, what like we always used to use stuff out of Mom's kitchen, right? We're like, hey, Paula, you got a mixing bowl, you know? But you know, to really do it right, I started going. Um, I saw, I heard an ad or saw it in the paper or something for a restaurant supply house in the city of Rochester. So one time, your mother and I took a ride. We went down there. And stopped in, and they had like these stainless steel rectangular tubs, like you would see, you know, if somebody's catering and they have mac salad in them or something, or put the meat in it over the burners. So, anyways, I, I bought, you know, I, I started going down there and buying a couple things at a time. I'd buy every year, I'd pop in and buy a couple of these, a couple of that, and I had some like Tupperware type tubs. But then, you know, then with the internet and and flyers that I get I, the lem products they had the meat logs and they're not that expensive so I bought I started buying some of those so over the years we've accumulated both stainless steel I got some big mixing bowls and they are so handy to have the stainless steel mixing bowls and the stainless steel meat logs but the plastic meat logs I actually probably like more they're quick easy to clean and um, you know I years ago we'd use like whatever pans we could get our hands oh, yeah. on and we were aluminum foil. you know rick would bring a bunch of uh, aluminum foil like the big huge lasagna pans you'd get you know and you'd run them through the process once or twice and they're junk and we're throwing them away so yeah it's um you know if you're only doing a, a couple deer let's say you know you got a deer or two or you and a buddy or a family member you're doing a little bit you know wouldn't cost you hardly anything to buy you know two meat lugs from Lems and, and they carry that stuff even there is a place over in Canada when they I think it's called Runnings yeah and they have um, you know meat grinders the blades I, I was surprised at how much stuff you they can, had there you can get you could get into a meat grinder um, oh pretty affordable pretty now. affordable yeah. like you go on Amazon yeah I know I've seen uh, one of the guys that I'm friends with out here I don't we, he's not in our hunting group but he was messaging us and back in the fall wondering what we were using for a grinder Danny and I, and uh, and we're just using one of the ones that's at the farm. It's just a farm's grinder. But anyway, he bought this $150 grinder with all these attachments, everything you could possibly need yep. off Amazon. And if you're only grinding, you know, if you're doing 100 pounds a year, right? I mean, that'll that thing. You don't will last need to five six hundred dollar grinders that we're no, buying. You know? No, and those grinders that you're buying, they will last 20 plus years. Oh, you'll be using them when I'm gone. Right. No, you can't go. <laughs> Don't go That's Dad. life, Bill. Don't go, Dad. The um, yeah, we you know we buy the the grinders we buy because like if you're if you're doing a smaller operation or maybe you wanna you know you get a turkey and you wanna make some turkey sausage you know a small little grinder will do you fine. We we had a hand grinder. I it's, I thought I was gonna try a hand grinder. That didn't last long. <laughs> you know that you clamp on the end of the table, but the um. When we start, run, I mean, those grinders turn on at like seven or seven thirty in the morning, and now, you know, in the old days we'd run them till four o'clock in the afternoon because we ran. If we made six, let's say we made six hundred and twenty-five pounds, 
run it through twice. We ran all that through the one grinder, that Thunderbird, because that's the only, that was all we had. Yeah. And uh, so by the time we got done in, in a day, that machine would do 1,300 pounds of meat and run all day long. So then we got thinking, you know, we've had this like 20, 25 years. We've like, we don't use it often, but when we use it, it runs like all day. And uh, it's funny, we used to, side story, when uh, we were at Bean Hill Road, I'd, we'd be running the grinder and your mother would do a load of laundry and it would it would kick the circuit. <laughs> I, yeah. I used to run in there and go, hey, don't or do laundry. I'm trying to grind. She'd be running the vacuum. Yeah. The vacuum would always pop it. So, uh, yeah, when I bought this house, I hired an electrician. Like we had closed, and three days later, there was a guy in there pulling new circuits right from the panel yeah. to make sure it would support the Bean Hill meat cutters. Which I ended up doing, running a service to the garage after. But when we first started, that would happen. But uh, yeah. but we we thought you know we should have a backup machine. And the other thing we thought is that if we had the backup machine, it doesn't have to sit there and, and reserve. We can run it. And my God, when we started doing that, that you know, then we started having you know two machines going one on a course grind one on a finish and i think this year when we like when jimmy was done with all his course grind he switched over and he i don't know if he was making stuff that was going to you for link yeah but you know we were doing we were doing more of a course grind straight into the straight into the stuffer for the link yeah because he used that uh it, it's called a stuffing plate and it's got like three oval uh like every 120 degrees right there's this so th instead of having a series of holes like a three-eighths plate or a five sixteenths or a quarter inch plate this thing's just got three ovals slots in it and it's a stuffing plate that would allow you to push the meat in you know and, and stuff summer sausage or casings without um you know over grinding it making it mealy you know chewing it up too small yeah so uh jimmy's but that has actually been turning out great product i might buy another one of those stuffing plates that's so that, been working really well that's something that we've found this is the second year that we've done that with our link sausage mm -hmm. is not pushed it through a fine a finer grind yeah. we're using just that stuffer plate that you were just just describing so literally the meat is i'm trying to think are we are we running it through that stuffer plate twice once to break it down yeah. and then once with the pork jimmy actually ran that you know we got a coarse grind plate and uh, the last two years, I think, Jimmy likes that stuffing plate so much. And it actually makes a nice cut. It, again, not chewing the meat up too much, but chewing it up enough. And, it, and it, I didn't think we'd get a good clean cut because of those slots. I thought that the knife, you know, maybe wouldn't perform as well against it. Mm -hmm. But Jimmy has run that straight through all the, like, all coarse grind. He's running through that stuffer plate. And then uh, he just left it right in there and switched over to, to a final grind for sausage mix. Right. And the, and the theory behind that is that you're not, you know, friction creates heat, heat breaks down the fat. Well, so, and the meat, you know, like if you go to your local meat shop or grocery store and you buy yourself a, some nice Italian sausage, the, the, the meat itself, like the pieces of meat are actually a little bit larger. And we found that, like we started noticing, like when we were making link sausage and we started to make more and more, you know, stuff in our casings, um, that our meat was like, um, it was denser what did not have the it was like ground yeah. too fine you know mike initially brought this up and goes i think we're we should stop using a fine grind for stuffing and I, we used to stuff through the grinder and this is the other thing that i think has made a huge difference is i don't care what you do when you take a conical tube or i guess you, ours was conical but now we have straight stainless steel tubes but still you're you're pushing it you know from a three inch throat into a what an inch or an inch and a quarter yeah. tube so you're pushing it and i think that grinder sits there and spins in the oh, meat yeah. so just in allowing it to free flow through the grinder um and then taking it and putting it in a stuffer and and just pushing it through i just think we get such a better product i agree so yeah the sausage so and then this year i i i wanted to do the high temp cheese so i bought oh God, i bought yeah. a couple different varieties of high temp cheese and I also bought a bunch of onions and peppers, and yep. that took me a long time. I chopped up a yeah, lot well, of onions and peppers the night before. So we were up, yeah, you well, and I we, were up to like midnight. Yeah, we were setting up and getting everything and getting all the stations set, and you're over there chopping up onions and peppers and crying and because of the, onion, the onions. Yeah, I, it wasn't emotional. It wasn't crying. emotional, it was but boy, onion the, crying. But it was uh, man, what a great idea! And um, holy hell, I mean, it is yeah. so good. So, I have, I don't. I had some of the stuff with the cheese in it on grind day, 
but because Billy's allergic to dairy, yeah. my son, we haven't eaten any of it yet. We will, but anytime we've been cooking since we ground our meat up, you know, we've been eating it as a family. So I'm, you know, we're just eating yeah. stuff with peppers and onions. But um, And that's the other fun thing we do on grind day. As, as the batches are going through, you know, guys will say, hey, take a couple of those, uh, you know, we had that chorizo seasoning. We had um, chorizo or chorizo? Chorizo, whatever it is. But, you know, the Italian, we take some different stuff and set it aside, put it in the fridge, and then when it comes time for lunch, we fire up the grill. And I swear to God, that stuff tastes so good. Fresh. It's, it's like, it's never, it's always good, but it's never as good as it is no. that day, yeah, you know? It was it's just fantastic. The stuff this year was just. But with the peppers, I think peppers, onions, I had one that had the works in it. Peppers, onions, and some of that high temp cheese. And you you upped your ratio of pork. I'm telling you what, that stuff was unbelievable. Yeah. Delicious. That was fantastic. So I think that was a pretty good summary of what our... Yeah. So we're, you know, and it's funny because uh, we should have started with a disclaimer that we have absolutely really no idea what we're doing. Yeah, it's just kind of trial and error. We're just self-taught and uh, learned from experience. So, and you you did allude to that, but just so everybody knows, like, you know, we we're not like by any means professional butchers um we we enjoy preparing our own game and i will tell you that the thing i've been thinking about trying and uh, uncle steve Renella kind of got me thinking about this but um with all the cooking stuff he has done in his cookbook but you know making like turkey sausage yeah you know we i, I, I shot a slammer did you yeah i shot a slammer of a gobbler last year and I got like this big turkey breast, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, I should grind that up and make a little sausage out of it, you know? Yeah. Um, and pheasants, you know, I got all these pheasants. I got a, you know, freezer, not full, but I have a lot of like pheasant breasts. I breast them out and I save the thighs. But I, I was thinking the same thing, you know, maybe I should try, you know, grinding up some of that pheasant. Just yeah. be try different things, yeah. you know? We have all the equipment. Yeah. You know, it's just a matter of breaking out and doing it. So I think it, words of advice that you and I could offer, number one, you're like, I had the thighs and, and um, the pheasant thighs, and I'm like, well, these will be good. You know, we'll cook them up. And my thought was to slow cook them in the crock pot, you know, and then pull the meat off and either make a soup or, you know, some, do something with the meat. Um, and we had this uh, marinade, and we put it on, your mom put it on this, uh, some chicken thighs, and then we, we you broil it, and... Uh, so we did that, and it was, like, absolutely delicious. So I'm like, we're going to try that next week with pheasant thighs. Yeah, that didn't work well. You don't want to broil pheasant thighs. No. They were all, it was like eating your boots. Really? I th- yeah, I threw them away, and we had a salad. That's too bad. But we did, remember, you uh, had Slow some turkey them. thighs, and we tried in the smoker. and That That same thing with that. And you got to keep them, you got to keep them wet. That's the key. Yeah, and I don't gonna... think you can keep them wet enough. I think it's such lean meat anyway on yeah. a on a game bird like that, you know. Yeah. I mean, I probably on a I don't know, on a domestic chicken or or a domestic turkey, you may have more fat in there, you know, but generally speaking, that's a very lean cut anyway. So right. Yeah, it's and there's nothing more frustrating than you know, we we do and I think it goes back to what you said like we take a lot of pride in in producing the meat and in producing the quality of the meat and then sharing it with others yep and and just eating it ourselves but when you when you lose when you lose a a chicken a pheasant thigh or you know you make a a turkey leg and it didn't turn out very well and you're you know it's just it's not edible there's just nothing it's like at a different it's a different it's it's frustrating but to me it's at a different level like if i if i had a venison roast and and i ruined it i'd be like oh my god right but i think if you're not a hunter and if you didn't put all the work into it then it might just be easier just to take that piece of meat and just throw it in the garbage can. But when you eat it, whether you hunted for it or you gathered it, yeah, it one feels way or different. Another, it feels way different. When you fail, it's a more epic fail than if you try a dish. You know, you went to the local grocery store and bought something, and cooked it, and you didn't like it. Right. It just feels different. You know, when I have all these, I was all excited. I marinated them an extra two days, and I was all excited. We took them out, and it was like the flavor was good, but you couldn't eat them. Yeah. But uh, then I'm like, oh, man. You live, you learn. Yeah, That's but you got to try, about. you know. And I think the one thing that I, I wanted to see what your thoughts were on this because it's been having a, having a son of my own and a child, I don't care whether you've got a boy or a girl, 
it has been incredibly rewarding to me to watch my son eat the food that I harvested yeah. and I prepared myself. Yeah. Like I and I, you know, I Sarah sits across. We love seeing Billy eat venison, but I like it's just this. I just feel full of pride, knowing that he is just the one thing that my kid loves to eat right now yeah. is venison. It doesn't matter whether it's burger or if it's sausage or if it's, you know, we had backstrap, and he just. I mean, when he sees oh, he us pull that out of the fridge to cook it, he's he's squealing. He's so excited. <laughs> he wants to eat it now, and it just makes me feel so good. I don't yeah. know. You obviously raised Jimmy yeah, and I. I mean, same way. And, and you know that your mother was not out of a, a hunting family, and um, she's been a trooper really. Because you think back. I mean, our entire life it was a rarity that we gave you a hamburger that was like a beef burger, or that we cooked a steak or something. Um, you know, like a beef steak. Right. You guys grew up on venison. I mean, we that's venison and fish, but mostly venison. And then your mother would supplement with chicken or something. You know. But, um, yeah, I always enjoyed it, and you guys loved it, the burgers we made and the steaks and everything and roasts and, you know, making – I remember, like, the first time that I, I had had pulled pork that this guy who drove bus for me uh, had a catering business, and I, I had him cater a party, and he had pulled pork. It was absolutely incredible. So I had him give me some of his sauce, which to this day, I don't know, he never would tell me how to make it, but it was incredible. So he gave me some of his sauce, and I took a venison roast, and I roasted that in a crock pot and then poured off the water and shredded it and ever since then you and jimmy and i have, have loved our pulled venison you know and, yeah. and uh so there's so many things you can do with it and it, it is very rewarding to watch your family enjoy you know the meat that you bring home and and uh it makes it a, a, a like a more complete or fuller experience i think you know we love to hunt right we love being out that whole thing you know we talk about hunting but then you bring the meat home and I absolutely, I swear to God, I love our butchering and making the venison sausage and, and all that that we do as a group. I enjoy that every bit as much as I do the hunting, yep. you know. And uh, it's just been great to have the group come together and stay together as long as we have and to see our sons come up through it, you and Jimmy, you know, worked into it. And, and, and both of uh, Chris's boys have been in it. Rick's uh, son has been in it. And, you know, we had fathers and sons and grandsons all together out there working and uh i'm looking forward to someday having little bill dan you he know, was out a, there this year yeah he was out there with us he'd like yeah. he liked running the uh sausage stuffer he did yeah so, yeah it's, it's what it's all about and i i guess hearing you talk about that it, it is direct it's not a surprise that jimmy and i are as passionate about doing this stuff as you are yeah. as far as you know on every every angle of the outdoors i mean that's it's you lived it you lived it with us when we were young and lit that fire and you know i came around a little bit later than jimmy because of what i was focused on as a kid yeah but you know i i'm i'm into it hey do you remember the first turkey right you now. shot not to change it so i see i do this i run off i'm like was it uh, the the one on top of the hill you wanted to kill a turkey it was a I'm, fall bird up yep yeah, and i gave you the gun yeah and we called we i very few fall birds I've killed, but we busted a flock, sat it was down. Right, it was right on the point. Right on the point, right where you have your climber now, right yep. in that area. And we sat down there, and, and uh, I had bought you a lifetime hunting license when you were like 10. Because I'm like, this is a gift that they'll just be able to enjoy their whole. They have a lifetime sportsman, I think, or something like that. Yep. But, you know, I, I could barely afford it, but I bought it. I bought one for you, and then a year or two later, I bought one for Jimmy. But I'll never forget we had the bird coming and you could tell it was coming straight in and and uh you didn't seem like you were uh all in on that on, on the kill so I, i'm like you want to shoot it and you're like no and i'm like i didn't as a dad you know, i didn't know quite what to do so i'm like well do you want me to shoot was it I, I or was i sitting right in in between your legs no you were sitting on the tree kind of behind me it was a big oak tree we we're at the base of it and you were uh, facing away, and I was like 120 degrees or not a little more 90 degrees around from you. And I could kind of see it at times coming. And I, so I said, well, well, what do you want to do? You know, and then do you want me to shoot it? And you're like, yeah, 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 you shoot it. <laughs> and so I'm like, slide the gun over to me. And so I kind of like had to roll over on onto my uh, side, and I was like twisted around the tree, and the bird, you know, I don't know, it was 20 yards or something, whatever it was. And so I shot, and I got this bird. And but and then you were excited as heck. 
you know. And, oh yeah, uh, I, and that was that was me. I, I didn't yeah. really want to pull the trigger. Well, I think what I've learned is sometimes it's not so much like I don't know whether it was a, the kill. I didn't know what was going on there, but there, there's a fear I think of that of the big boom, right? With a you know, we had a 12 gauge shotgun, and you're like 12 years old. That was you were just starting. Yeah. And I remember going home and telling your mother. I said I. I said, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but there's a possibility Billy might not be a hunter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I'm joking with her, you know. I said, I wish, you know, I hope that $375 license wasn't for nothing. But, yeah. you know, and then you look at you now with, uh, it, but people do catch on at different phases. Uncle Mike was a little bit of a late starter. Chris was a late starter. Um, so everybody kind of gets going, but it's now it's it's part of our fabric, you know. It's who we are. I and, think you, um, you did a good job of letting and we need to do a separate it'll be a separate conversation because we could go on for 40 minutes on just the talking about this but you got to let the kid from what i remember you never pushed me to pull the no. trigger i wanted no. to be right there with you yep. and when i was ready you let me i mean i missed so many deer with my bow and i'm going to tell you half of those deer i wanted to miss them yeah i didn't want to kill that deer you weren't ready no and so it was awesome i got just as I was bummed I wasn't killing these deer, but I was, I mean, I, I literally probably shot and missed, shot at and missed probably a dozen deer before I hit one with a bow. Yeah. And almost all of those were probably me saying, I don't really want to shoot this, but I want to be able to go back to camp and tell everybody I almost shot a deer. Yeah, I, I had a shot. Yeah. So, and those are the memories I have from growing up was we were always welcome at camp. We were, yeah. we were part of everything. If we wanted to be out there trying to kill we could do that if not we could just do well i can we remember we, we'd be bow hunting and you guys were you know of the age to legally hunt you know 12 or 14 years old or whatever your small game and you'd be like we want to hunt squirrels we want, you know and, and uh you know of course most people don't want kids running around the property with 22s hammering away at squirrels but i would i'd go to the other side of the property get in my tree stand and and you know, I'd hear you guys banging away at squirrels. But you know what? It's like you were out there. You were having fun. You were yeah, we hunting were... how you wanted to hunt. And you know, I I took both of you guys were with me. Both you and Jimmy, not at the same time, but both of you were nine years old when you were with me on when I took a deer. Your first deer, you know, that was taken was nine years old, and uh, and and that was. Uh, you know, I kind of resolved. I had killed a lot of big bucks, and uh, it was kind of uh, that was back when guys weren't getting big bucks. So it was it was the anomaly that you know people were like, "Jesus, mighty! Look at the bucks you're getting. How are you doing that?" And you guys, we got to the point where you know I consciously made a decision that you know I'm going to have to change my hunting to get these boys into it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to chase big bucks and do the things I I did because that's not going to be fun for them. So I don't care, but I got big bucks on the wall. Right now, the bigger trophy is passing the legacy and my passion on to my boys and spending the time with you guys. And so I went dry there for quite a while as far as shooting, you know, big deer. And I was never all about big deer. I just happened to get them. Yeah. Um, but I think that it was, uh, it's far more rewarding to, um, you know, to have your kids uh, get started, to have them with you in that quality time that we spent together. And don't regret any of that for a minute. Nope. They were good years, and it's going to be fun to do that for many years to come with, with little Bill Dan. And I, I'd like to, I'd like to do a podcast to get together with, uh, with you and Joel and Jimmy and I. I think that'd be a really that would fun be podcast a fun one. because, you know, Joel was so. I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that lately. That Joel was so, he was so important in Jimmy and I's youth, and you always had Jimmy and I. And Joel was right there. You know, he never had a, an actual a, a child have, of his right, own. Right. So Jimmy and I were his boys. And and he, you know, he did the same thing. Not to interrupt you, I'm sorry, but he did the same thing that I did in making a, a very conscious sacrifice, knowing that his hunting wouldn't be the same. But he never batted an eye. He said, "I'll take one. Which one do you want today?" Yeah. And and you know, quite honestly, if if he hadn't done that, I'd have been taken one at a time. Like, Jimmy, you got to stay home this weekend, or Billy, you got to stay home. Or, you know, I didn't know how to juggle that. And Joel stepped right up, and he's like, I mean, we joked about him being, like, you know, your second father, when, you know, with the outdoors and the stuff you did with him. So it was, yeah. uh, you know, you talk about mentoring and getting new folks and getting young kids into it. 
You know, he's he's uh, you know, he and I are best friends, but he didn't have to do that. You no, know, he yeah. didn't. And that yeah. and I think you don't. I didn't. Until you get older, you can't. You can't. Carp- compartmental. Carp- compartmentalize. Compartmentalize. It. Thank yeah. you. You can't. You can't like digest what the importance was of what that individual did to sacrifice. Right. 15 to You don't 20, realize 20 it years. in the moment. No. Or even five or ten years later. No. You look back a long time later and you're like, wow. Wow, that guy really gave something for me. He, you know, he he really went above and beyond. And and, and that's, you know, you you were talking with somebody, I think, um, I was on one of the podcasts, but hunters in general, you know, good people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think that, um, you know, taking care of our own and and teaching kids and bring them along but that's the beauty of camp you'd be up at camp you get up in the morning and joel be like come on billy you're with me today jimmy you know i'd be like come on jim and and we hunted together like we'd we'd still hunt a side hill or one of you would be in the valley and i'd take the other and go up the side hill and we had our our radios and and actually our fire radios because we were both officers in the fire (laughs) department so but uh great times great times times. yep well thanks for the ride home you're very welcome my truck is Thanks okay. for the conversation. Yeah, it's good. It's finally, it's captive. I, I, I got you contained here. Yeah. You're harder to oh, get no, a hold of. Oh, no, it wasn't me. I, have, I got you contained. Oh, is that right? That's the hard part. Oh, okay. All right. But No, it was great. Good conversation, and, and I hope, um, you know, the takeaway for folks is that um, it's a whole other dimension to this hunting thing um, if you take time to build up on it. And it doesn't have to be the guys out of the camp, you know. And and as you said, we, didn't, we started out very much – novice and had nothing you know and and we've worked up to where we are now but uh it's it's a good thing to do and it's very rewarding i would encourage anybody to take on uh, the processing of their own game yep absolutely all right thanks willie appreciate it good job thank you have a good have a good evening willie fading them fading (laughs) them